I love to praise and worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we'll go ahead and get started. I know that we had just a lot of announcements, and, and it's just something sometimes we just have to do. So if you're visiting with us, bear with us. And, uh, and so we just get all those things done. You know, with March Madness going on, how many of you are basketball fans? Raise your hand. Right? And so basketball has took over, and it does every March, and the March Madness fans, and, and all the basketball craze. What a great time to use a sports analogy uh, to set up my sermon this morning. Now, how many of you own a jersey from your favorite team, no matter the sport? Raise your hand. On a jersey. I, I did for a long time. I think when we moved, I finally threw it away because the player don't even play for that team anymore. Amen. Then I found out he came back to the team. And I don't even like sports that well, and I had one, right? So, that, so you raise your hand on that. Now, how many of you wear them during games? Raise your hand. All right? Okay. That's good. Don't be shy. Come on now. All right. So, now, for argument's sake, I'm going to, to believe that you do that out of support for your team and not as a good luck charm to win. Amen? So, I, I, so for argument's sake, I'm just going to, to, to guess that you do that just to support the team and not as a good luck charm. So, good, that being said, there are many sports fans out there that believe their good luck rituals will somehow bring a win to their team. For some reason, they don't trust in the skill and possibly the abilities of the players and the coaching staff anymore. Many times, so-called Christians try to use Jesus in the same way. Instead of trusting in his power and his deity on a daily basis, they only pull him out during the big game. Amen. I got a friend of mine that every time, it, it just depends. He'll be just, everything will be going fine, don't matter where he's at. But if his team starts to fall behind, he goes and gets the big number one finger from the school and he goes and puts on the jersey and he says, well, they can tell I've got everything on. They're going to fight a little harder. So well, you're lost your mind. Right? And so we know a lot of people like that. And I'm just, I'm, I'm using this analogy as because it's March Madness to set up the series that we've been in for the past couple of weeks. What does it mean to be a born again Christian? Right? And, and so the, the, the scripture we're going to look at real quickly here this morning is going to deal with talking about when do you use Jesus? Do you just pull him out when it's a big game on the line? Do you just turn to him when things are bad, when, when things can't get any, any worse? And you're like, well, now, now I've got to go to Jesus or now I've got to go to prayer. Is this the only time that we turn to Jesus just like in a big game is the only time that we turn to him when we're wanting to win? Do we... Do we go through the rituals, but we don't have the power there within? Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Great, great book of, of, of prophecy here. Looking at 1 Samuel when he became a prophet. To give us a little history, Eli, who was his mentor, who was the priest, had grown old. A couple weeks ago, I, I talked about, do you know God's voice when he calls? And we talked about when Samuel first went to live with Eli, and God was calling him, and he would say, yes, here I am, Eli. And Eli said, I didn't call you, and it was God calling him. He said, you tell God that you're here, and you're his servant. How can, you know, what can you do for him? And so we know that, that uh, uh, Samuel was called into the prophetic office. So in that history, Eli the priest had grown old. His two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are still the priests who are in charge of the tabernacle. This is Eli's two sons. They're in charge of the tabernacle, even though God had told Eli to get rid of them due to their wickedness. At this time, Israel had became wicked. These two men were wicked. They were the priests in charge of the tabernacle. Uh, in, in, in different verses, it talks about that they were they were um, being with the women who would come to, to bring their offerings unto the tabernacle. And, and they would use that position to, to be with women. The children of Israel had grown cold to God. 
and have become a generation of idol worshipers and blasphemers. Starts to look familiar to the world in which we live today. Had became a generation of idol worshipers, money worshipers, possession worshipers, and blasphemers of God's holy name. And Samuel has become a prophet. Now look at chapter 4. We're going to be in chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1. And we'll go through verse 11. In honor of God's word, if you would please stand while I read His holy, perfect, precious an authoritative word. I'm going to come out of the NIV this morning, but I'll have some notes out of the KJV as well that I'll be looking at. And in four, it, four of the first in one A, it's all it's kind of a a uh, lead in, but it's also a lead out from from three uh, from three twenty one. It says, "And Samuel's word came to all Israel." This is just saying that Samuel now is considered. The office of prophet. He has become a prophet. He's known to be the prophet of Israel now at this time. And so Samuel's word came to all of Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines camped at Apex. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on this battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why? Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Now, the, the ark was, was remembered to contain the Shekinah glory of God. Wherever the ark went, God was there. And that's kind of how they looked at it. And we're going to learn some more about that. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim and Eli's, and Eli's two sons, talking about Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. They would have went to the tabernacle to get the Ark of the Covenant, and these two priests were in charge of the tabernacle. These two wicked priests were in charge of the Ark. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all of Israel raised such a great shout, all right, that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked what's all this shouting in the hebrew camp about what, what are they shouting about over there what what are they so happy about we we've killed four thousand of their men what do they have to be happy about what are they excited about when they learned that the ark of the lord had come into the camp the philistines were afraid a god has come into the camp you see that a god has come into the camp not the god they said, we're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? Got a plural there and a little g. They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews talking about the Israelites, as they have been subject to you all of these years. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated. And every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers during that battle that they had in possession of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, die. My question, as we look at, the, at this set of, of Scripture, we 
we see that what they did to, to try to win, but it did not bring them a victory. They went out and did exactly what they remembered their ancestors doing, but it did not bring them a victory. They did what was told to, to, to do with and Jericho, but it did not bring them a victory. They actually lost more men when they went and got the ark. My question this morning is this. Do you really believe or are you just using Jesus as some sort of good luck charm each week? Do we truly believe in the almighty changing power of God? Do we truly believe that the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and is a change maker in our lives? Or are we just using Jesus Christ and Calvary as some sort of sick, twisted, lucky charm. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord God, we're still in this series, Father, that you kept us in for the past couple weeks. Lord God, I need you more today than ever before. Lord God, we've seen such an outcrying and an outpouring of support over this series, Father. Lord God, but it's so hard to preach. It's so hard to to bring forth to the congregation, Father, but I trust in you. We trust in you. And we know that we'll hear exactly what you would have us hear. Father, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So that is the question. Do we really believe? Do we really believe That Jesus Christ is this great change agent. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says it. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things, A-L-L, all things will become new. Do we believe this? Are we trusting in this? Are we just looking to Christ or to God, or to whoever it is, just to get us through some kind of tough time like some kind of lucky charm. A rabbit's foot, so to say. Do we throw an extra 20 in because we've been extra bad this week? Do we just turn to God for luck? And for a lucky charm, write this down. Are you going into battle without Jesus? Remembering what our focus is on in our series, what does it mean to be a born-again Christian? Keeping that on your mind as we go through these bullet points here this morning. Are you going into battle without Jesus? In verse 1, we see that Samuel has become the prophet. He is the one Israel is supposed to look to for guidance from God. He's the one that they're supposed to go to. Should we go into battle? Should we not go into battle? Should we take a left? Should we take a right? Samuel is the one who would guide them as a type of the Holy Spirit. He would act. So we know that he plays that role. But in verse 1b, if you'll look with me at 1b, it says this, the Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Apex. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated. We see that Israel did not turn to God before going into battle with the Philistines. They did not turn to Samuel and say, Samuel, what should we do in this case? Samuel, what should we do? Should we go forth into battle and fight? Should we go forth into battle and and try to defeat them at this time? The Israelites never turned to God. The Israelites never turned to Samuel and said, what should we do? What would God have us to do? My question, are you going into battle today without God? 
are you? We see where it got the Israelites. Are you going into battle on a daily basis without God? Are you turning to God to find out which way you should go, left or right, who you should marry, where you should go to work, what house you should build, where you should build it, how you're going to take on those people at your job on a daily basis. Are you going to God? Are you trying to do it on your own? That's our point. That's the point here. Samuel was God's man on the ground. What he said was God's word. God spoke through him. Israel was the nation that were God's chosen. They were to turn to Samuel for everything that they would need. Where should we go? 2,000 years ago, God gave us his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'll leave with you the comfort. We become sealed with the Holy Ghost of God upon salvation. He is a change maker. Do you turn to God in your time of need? Do you turn to God to figure out where it is you need to go next? Israel did not, and we see what happened. From the word went out against, in the King James Version, you'll see that it says that Israel went out against the Philistines and it leads us to believe that Israel moved first I don't like the way the NIV puts that but the KJV does a good job it leads us to believe that Israel moved first and all without consulting Samuel whatsoever this was not a one time thing either this was not just a oops we're sorry we didn't get the memo right that we needed to ask Samuel this was understood you ask God's man before God's people did anything in God's name. It was not their right to move. They didn't have the right to act on their own behalf. They didn't have the right, the right to do anything in their own power. They were God's people. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are Jesus' son or daughter. You don't have the right to make a decision on your own. You don't have the right to take a step left or right without consulting the Father first. That's why he's here. That's who he is in our life. Is that who Christ is for you? Is he a lucky charm? Or is he the center of your universe? Nothing's coming down the pipe unless it goes through Christ first. Nothing's getting in here unless it goes through Christ first. I'm not going anywhere that Christ wouldn't have me to go. Why? Because I'm going to ask him first. Are you God's children? Are you Christ's son or daughter? Are you adopted into the family of God? If you claim to be a born-again Christian, then yes, you are. And that means you gave up your right to do all things on your own at that point. As we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, we actually less and less want to do on our own. We want to please the Father. Verse 2 lets us know that when we move without God, we will be defeated. Look at verse 2 real quickly. As it says, as the battle spread, the Israelites was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them. When we move without God, we can expect to be defeated. Amen. Secondly, write this down. Are you trying to use Jesus Christ as a good luck charm? Are you trying to use Christ as a good luck charm, as, as 
some lucky charm in your life to help you get through certain situations. In verse 3b, the Word of God says, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh. Not only did they not ask God if they could go into battle with the Philistines, but they also did not ask him if they could go and get the ark. Neither did God tell them to go and get the ark. So here we got a three-time loser here. They didn't ask God if they could go or should go and fight the Philistines. God never told them to do that. They didn't ask God or Samuel if they could go and remove the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle in which it was. Nor did God come to them and tell them, go get my Ark, and then you'll have victory. Three-time losers. They did not care about the things of God. People who care about the things of God turn to God. People who love the Lord turn to the Lord. People whose hearts have been changed by the Holy Spirit of God residing in them turn to the Holy Spirit of God when they're searching for direction in their life. It's just the fact. Did not even tell them to go and get the ark. John 6 4 4 states this No one can come to me unless the Father in heaven draw him. No one comes to the Father unless he be drawn. God never drew these men unto himself. I want you to look at it like that. They went to the ark on their own power. They came to the altar on their own power. They came to the altar because a whole group of people were coming to the altar that day, so I went to the altar. But God never drew them. The Holy Spirit never drew them that day. They went to the tabernacle without God's blessing. They were not supposed to be there. He had not drawn them. No one comes unto me unless my Father in heaven draw him. Verse 4, we see it says this, read with me. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hupni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Here we see Eli's sons holding godly positions. Godly positions. They're priests at the tabernacle. That means you've got to see them to bring your sacrifice. You've got to see them to go and repent. You've got to go through these two priests who hold these priestly titles. And remember what I said at first. God had done charged Eli to do away with them. He said, you get rid of them two boys of yours. They're wicked. They've got wicked stuff going on down at the gate of the tabernacle. Eli went to them and says, listen, this is bad, boys, but never, ever did he bring them under submission. Never ever did he fire them. Never ever did he make them leave. Put them in prison. Later on we'll see that God holds Eli personally responsible for that. Eli's sons holding godly positions but do not care about the things of God. What were they doing? They were putting on a front. Any people in churches do that today? Putting on a front. Men sitting in pulpits do not.
not care about the things of God putting on a front. Men holding the chair in the office of deacon do not care about the things of God putting on a front. Sunday school teachers, Bible school teachers, discipleship teachers, people who go on mission trips who do not care about the things of God, they're putting on a front. They've never been drawn by God, they've never repented of their sins to God, and they've never asked Jesus Christ to come into their heart and save them. And as I said last week, sometimes it's no fault of their own. It's just the way that they've always known. It's the only way they've ever known. It's what Grandma said. It's what Papa said. I said that last week. I talked about preachers. So instead of being God called, their mama called. A lot of Christians are like that. They've just always done it the same way. And when you try to preach something like this, you start ruffling the feathers and you start you start cutting at the flesh of the very thing that holds them together they just close down they close their ears they close their eyes they stick their head in the sand I don't want to hear it no more preacher I know I got it I know I got it are you sure no but I can't listen to no more what you're not sure but what would people think of me now I'd be embarrassed people would be mad because I've taught their kids no they wouldn't they praise Jesus I said this last week there's no longevity program to being a Christian you don't get an extra two weeks vacation when you die whether you come today or whether you came 25 years ago it's all the same brother you're still getting in to examine ourselves we have to be careful putting on the front verses 6 through 8 here we see the false professors of God using the ark like a good luck charm enjoying the benefits of the relationship without the responsibility that comes with it they come walking back into the to the camp they're, they're gloriously hollering they're yelling woo Oh, it's going to be a great victory. We've got God on our side. We've got the ark. Oh, I remember the stories from the old days. Oh, hallelujah. And what God done in the old days. And oh, we've got him now with us. Oh, it's going to be a great, mighty victory. Trying to enjoy the benefit of the relationship without the responsibility that comes with it. They never repented of their sin. They were never drawn by God, and they never accepted God, uh, God as, as Jehovah God in their life. We have Christians today doing the same thing, or so-called Christians. If they would have just gone to God on his terms, listen to me. If they would have just gone to God on his terms, that's what the tabernacle was there for, to repent of sin. If they would have truly felt repentant, knowing that God wasn't with them from the first battle, but instead of, of trying to do things right, instead of begging God to love them and forgive them of their sin, they said, we'll just trick them. We'll go get the ark anyway, and we'll carry it around like a good luck charm. If they would have just gone to God on his terms instead of trying to make God come to them on their terms. We as Christians today, somehow we, we lose the mark, and we forget that this isn't our world, this is God's world not this world this is the devil's world but this is God's world we serve him he doesn't serve us we're here for him we were put here by him for him we're not here to extend our 401k we're not here to see how many toys that we can that we can bring together and acquire over the next 45 years of life we're here to serve God we were put here by 
him and for him. The world cannot get that through their head. Oh, you're a peculiar people. Why in the world would you serve somebody that you can't even see? I'm out here making money hand over fist, doing what I want to do, when I want to do it. Why in the world would you do it any other way? Because we know that a Savior lives. And blinded eyes have been opened. And now I can see. Can you see this morning? Can you see today? If they would have repented of their sins when they reached the tabernacle to get the ark and trusted in Jehovah God, things could have been different. Things could have been a lot different. Who are you trusting in today? Are you trusting in the Lord today? Are you trusting Him for all of your needs? Or just when you can't handle it, write this down and we're almost done, we'll be out of here. And you'll make it to Bojangles before you know it. Lastly, there must be repentance before there can ever be victory. There must be repentance before there can ever be victory. Verse 10 states that Israel fought, but they lost. Wow. They went and got the ark of God. They made it a point. They had two priests, high priests, from the tabernacle in charge of the ark, with the ark, with them. There was no way that they could lose. And they lost. Israel lost the battle. They fought, but they still lost. Law. Second Timothy, and if you watch my devotional times, you'll recognize this. Second Timothy three five talks about having a form of godliness, but no power within. The Israelites had a form of godliness. They were carrying the ark around. They were holding the ark up high. They were scaring off everybody. Saying, "Oh yeah." You remember the ark. You, you've read the stories, what the ark's done. The only problem was it was just a form of godliness. They didn't have the power that went along with it. What does it mean to be a born-again Christian? It means you've got power. You're not walking around with a form of godliness. You've actually took the responsibility you've been drawn by the Holy Spirit of God you've repented of your sins you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and to be the Lord of your life to be the Lord of your life not to be part of your life not to be your co-pilot but to be the center of your universe why? because Christ will not have it any other way baby Christ does not come into our life to play second fiddle to your flesh. Amen? It's not what he does. They had a form of godliness, but they had no power within. They were like a deck of cards. You could see them up the front, and you could see them in the back. But when you turn them sideways, they had no substance. Many Christians are living their lives like that today. Many so-called Christians are living their lives like that today. And I say the word so-called not to embarrass, hurt, or demean. I say it in love to say that can all change today. You don't have to spend another day without salvation in your heart. It can all change today. But there's a lot of Christians walking around. And they ain't had power in a long time. They can remember a time when they were zealous and on fire for Christ, but that's been a long time ago. And now what they do is they say, well, I did a lot of that when I was younger, but I'm older now. I, I just want to relax. When God's done with you, believe me, you won't have to worry about it because the only people who know about it be your family. When he's 
done with you, he'll bring you home. If you're still on this earth, if you still have breath in your lungs, I don't care if you're in a wheelchair or if you're on a walker, God has a use for you. We're here to serve the kingdom of God. When he's done with you, he'll take you home. So many people today say that they are Christians, but the Bible says this, few, few, F-E-W, few will enter in that gate. Few will do it the right way. Few will come to heaven. Few. Not your pastor's words, the Bible's words, Almighty God's words. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many will enter that way. Narrow is the road, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few will enter. Few. Do you know why few will enter? Because in these days, people will deceive themselves about being born-again Christians. They would rather stick their heads in the sand and not know the truth and just say, let me just get through, let me say a couple words to pacify the ears of, of these other people to make them believe that, that I've got it too. Instead of doing what it takes to be saved. They've trusted in lies, false professors, allow themselves to be deceived sometimes of no harm of their self to no fault of their self but God has flipped the light on today and over the past three weeks God has been turning the light on on many of your lives and he says this is what you need few will enter not because everybody's a bunch of drug addicts drug addicts, alcoholics, womanizing, cheating on their husband, people, those are the ones that are going to hell. No. Few will enter. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, remember last week, will enter the kingdom of God. There's going to be a lot of people come judgment day, but he says, I never knew you who cried, Lord, Lord, and did miracles and miraculous things in his name. But they never did what it takes. They never allowed the Holy Spirit of God to draw them, sensitize their heart, come to the altar, come to their knees, come to a place of repentance, repent of their sins, realize that they're separated from God by their sin. And I said this last week, and I'll say it again. Do you know why the Bible says that we must be drawn by his Father who is in heaven? Because if you're not drawn by the Holy Spirit of God, then you don't realize you're a sinner. Amen? I told you the reasons behind mine. I, I had no clue I was sinning. I agreed with everything that I did. Had no clue that I was sinning until the Holy Ghost of God came upon my life and showed me that I was a dirty, rotten sinner. And if I didn't do something right then, I was going to hell. That's the way I knew that I was a sinner. I was drawn by God. Repent of your sins. Ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And expect there to be a change in you. You will know them by their fruit. If you think that my Jesus can come and live in you, not changed well you've got another thing coming he's the great change maker baby that's what he does he changes lives he takes people from the ditch and he puts them on the mountaintop he says you are a son or daughter of the most high God now he changes lives how dare we think that we could walk around with nothing changing about us, living in our own flesh the way we were two weeks ago before we came to an altar and think that God lives in you. He's the God of the universe. His son went to Calvary. He lived a sin.
sinless life for 33 years. He split the Red Sea. He raised Lazarus from the dead. You mean to tell me that he can't take away the cussing out of your mouth? You mean to tell me he can't take the alcohol out of your hands? He's God, baby. That's what he does. He's the great change maker. He changes lives. shows us that when we try to claim power verse 10 does verse 10b shows us that when we try to claim power in the name of Jesus but lack having that power a great slaughter will take place right did you see that only 4,000 were killed the first time or 3,000 were killed the first time nobody was running around claiming Jesus as Savior Nobody was running around saying, we got God. 3,000 are slaughtered. They come back claiming to be children of God. They come back with the ark in the hand. They come back saying, whoo, look at us. We've got God. It said that a great slaughter took place that night. Why, God was mad. He said, how dare you go in my name and you don't even know me. Come judgment day, a great slaughter will take place of people who ran around claiming the name of Christ and it says, I never knew you. No power. Verse 11, as we close, you might win a temporary pleasure from men. As the Philistines were so afraid, they were so scared when they heard all the hollering going on, woo! Boy, they're real. They're real over there. You might win temporary pleasure from men, but you will lose the battle. Eli's sons were wicked, yet they claimed to have a relationship with the Almighty God so much that they were the priest at the tabernacle, and it cost them their lives. Dear ones, what does it mean? to be a born-again Christian. There's been a change in your life. There's power residing inside of you. Maybe it's been a while since you've had that zeal that can change here today. But maybe you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. And that too can change here today. Eyes closed and heads bowed, please. If I could get a little bit of music, guys.